Well, let's bring in Jeff Regan, who knows all about winning a speaker's election. He is the former longtime MP for Halifax West, and he served as Speaker of the House from 2015 to 2019. Jeff Regan, good to see you once again here on CPAC. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be with you. So let's talk about the vote today. We aren't showing the actual numbers, of course, of how MPs voted. The ballots are destroyed, but we do have the ultimate result, which is Greg Fergus winning. I want to start with getting your reaction to the fact that he's the MP who's emerged victorious here. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate Greg. Uh, I think he'll do a terrific job. Uh, we were seven excellent candidates. They're all friends of mine. I wish them all well. Uh, I'm very pleased with this result. I think that Greg uh, has the attributes necessary to be a superb speaker. He uh, is very calm under pressure. Uh, he's, I think people recognize him as someone who will be fair. He's never been unduly partisan. Um, and as someone who's familiar with the procedures of the House and its practices, as well as the atmosphere of the place, but also someone who has the strength uh, to do what he needs to do uh, in the chair, while at the same time respecting the members of all, the rights of all members, pardon me, to free expression. And that's a, a fine balance to achieve. Okay, and we will talk about the challenges he faces in that role. But I want to just ask you about the voting process itself, since you have that experience of having run uh, and won. Uh, talk to me a bit about the politics of getting elected speaker, because we know that there was an effort to get an opposition member in the chair, Deputy uh, Speaker Chris Dontremont speaking uh, about that. Uh, give me your sense of the process uh, as you see it that led to Mr. Fergus ultimately emerging victorious here. Well, as you know, there were uh, five Liberal MPs who were candidates for Speaker, one Conservative, one NDP, and of course, Green Party leader Elizabeth May, my, my law school classmate uh, and old friend. And um, so the, mem the, the, the candidates uh, for Speaker would, in all likelihood, have been on the phone over the past number of days, reaching out to their colleagues in all parties, uh, trying to enlist their support and persuade them that they're the person they should uh, choose for speaker, hearing what they had to say about their priorities, because it's an opportunity that members have when the when these candidates call to say, look, this is something that's important to me. I can recall members talking about the question of whether they could breastfeed in the House, for example, or, or have a young infant in the House. And, and um, so, you know, at, or other things that are of concern to them. And of course, we've seen members, uh, whether it's breastfeeding or having an infant, uh, uh, in the House uh, or other services that, that because of the way that society and the House of Commons has changed over the years. So that process has taken place. There are big conversations among MPs within parties and sometimes across different parties to say, look, what do you think and what are you doing and who do you think is the, are, are the best candidate or who is the best candidate here? Uh, I haven't been part of it this time, of course, so it's hard for me to know what those discussions were exactly. Uh, but now we have a new speaker. OK, and that new speaker says he's going to act quickly to bring honour back to the House in the wake of Anthony Rhoda's resignation and what MPs have been calling the global embarrassment of honouring the SS unit uh, veteran with the president of Ukraine on the floor of the chamber. You mentioned Elizabeth May, who was in the running. She said in her speech that this could have been avoided if the rules were followed for recognising someone in the House. So I want to ask you as a former speaker, is it a question of applying the rules as they are or does the new speaker need to be changed? Changing the vetting process. I think I should leave that to the to the speaker and to the members to have that th those conversations to have a discussion, you know, whether it's one on one or otherwise. The, the House could uh, have it, you know, have an actual debate on this question and bring forward ideas, or members could bring them uh, directly to the speaker uh, about you know ideas about how to fix this. Uh, generally speaking, it has been at the speaker's discretion, uh, you would recognize, for example, provincial ministers or premiers, uh, former members of the House sometimes be recognized, at times be people who have won awards, national awards, for example. Uh, you know, there are a, a variety of things. And in fact, I remember one time when my wife was in town and she was a provincial minister, I was the speaker, I had previously once recognized her. And so after question period, Dominic de Blanc got up but asked it would be permissible for him to recognize her, right? Of course, by doing so, you know, he just introduced her. And in fact, it wasn't because generally you only do that with a provincial minister once 
per term with the government. So I had to say no, but I thanked him for his kindness anyway. Okay, I want to ask you this with the minute we have left. Uh, decorum and respect, those are words Mr. Fergus used today. When you won the speaker's race nearly eight years ago, you used similar words. It seems we hear that talk every time there's a speaker's election, but it also seems that the song remains the same when it comes to complaints about tone and tenor, especially in this fall sitting so far. Why is it so hard to change the atmosphere and the behavior inside the chamber? Well, uh, in, our, in a democracy, you're going to have a competition. And with the history of our democracy and our House of Commons, there, you, know, you have the opposition parties there who uh, want to uh, hold the government to account. Um, each of them wants to organize their attack in their own way. Some of them feel very strongly. Sometimes members, when they're speaking, will try to you know riot, uh, to raise the ire of members on their side to react to something. Sometimes they're they're speaking for the cameras or for a clip they can use uh, on social media. And so I think it's more challenging than ever uh, to uh, tamp this down. Um, and it, I think it requires cooperation from members and from across party lines, but uh, it's certainly worth a discussion. And, um, and I think the new speaker is uh, very well placed and has the kind of skills, uh, that if anyone can do this, he can. All right. We'll have to leave it there. Jeff Regan, thanks for your time on this. Thank you.